Warning. Huge discount code coming. Announcement, announcement. I'm making an announcement. I am holding my first official public poker retreat. Now, I've had a few practice runs just to make sure that I can really understand how the functionalities of these things work, how it's just like feeling out the energy of it, but this is the first time I'm going full out. I'm talking Michelin star chef living on, on site. I'm talking every hour used to its ultimate utility. I'm gonna be living on site as well and the biggest announcement. I'm gonna be sharing with everybody that joins and I'm gonna be vetting who joins because I know a lot of people are gonna want this, but not everybody I wanna teach everything. I'm going to be teaching everything I know about live tells. Now, there are some live tells that I believe have made me at least a couple of million dollars in my career. And it's not just seeing them, it's also understanding the nuances of the game and how they interact with each other. This is the main star, <laughs> the main event of the evening, or at least of these, these five days on, from uh, July 22nd to July 28th. I know that's six, maybe five and a half, whatever. I am going to be teaching everything I know about live tells. Now, if you want to learn more information, you can reach me on an email that I'm going to leave in the description and also via Instagram or Twitter if they are your preferred methods of communication. Peace. Ladies and girls, ladies and gentlemen, and everything in between, Bankroll Challenge is. Oh, it's back. It's back. It feels great to be able to say that. Oh my gosh, is this a fucking grind? I had no idea what I was cutting out for myself, what kind of chunky challenge I was giving myself for saying that I was gonna grind up 10K to 100K. And don't get me wrong, the poker side of things, I think I'll find fucking easy. But the bureaucratic nonsense, which you think I'd be used to, because I'm setting up a fucking charity launching since right to look out for it. Oh my goodness. It is so difficult to jump around all of the red tape nonsense that the casino is putting out there. So getting filming permission in, in any of these casinos is just absolutely atrociously difficult. Which, by the way, is really, really, really stupid on the casino's behalf. It's like such a small amount of effort to just rewrite some of the bureaucratic shit. And they will get so many, like the last episode I did, episode one got 30 something thousand views. I could say, hey, I like this casino. It's really, really good. You should go check it out. And then they just get the freest fucking advertising of their life. But no, 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 no. Don't want to be stepping on anybody's toes up in the HR or PR or whatever there are department. What that leaves me with is two choices. Either I tiptoe around the red tape and film and I play some hands and I'm like secretly filming, but I don't really tell people where I'm at and you know you don't really get to see so much of the footage or I go to a private game now this was the decision that I was faced with and lo and behold I chose the second option because I'm not a bureaucratic kind of guy I don't know if you can tell that from me I'm not the kind of guy that sits with a suit and tie so I went to this private game in episode one which went fantastically well until they fucking with all the love and all the respect to them of course scams the crap out of me I'll tell the whole story at the end of this episode and I'm excited to tell it. it's a funny one at least and I knew that, that was a chance going into it I actually thought it was probably like a tiny tiny percent chance because who would why would they scam people if they're scamming people selectively why would you do it with somebody with an audience it makes no sense but we'll talk about that later and now we're going into the bankroll challenge we're playing at the can't say the name of the casino that's right because I'm secretly filming there and uh, we're playing at my, one of my favorite casinos, which I'm not going to give them free advertisement for anyway, in London, central London. And I was taking a shot, and I've got to be honest, I wasn't really feeling it. I can't, I, the, 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 the anxiety, not anxiety, but like the anticipation of having to go in and not really be able to film and have to like tiptoe around it, it was kind of annoying and I really, really didn't, didn't want to play it, but I forced myself to play because I was like, you know, I'm not just gonna leave this challenge, I'm gonna fucking do it. Uh, so we go in for day two of the bankroll challenge and we've had to throw our bankroll back down to 10K because I'm not, obviously not gonna count it, uh, count the, the lost non-paid profits that I got scammed out of. So, feeling a bit dicey, but we're here to grind, we're here, we know that we're gonna be the best player at absolutely any table we'll sit at. Let's fucking crush some souls. Enjoy the video. Much love. So we 
sitting down at the table, it's always a bit of a weird experience sitting down at a local 1-2 or 2-5 or 5-10 game because I've, I get very, very, very many stares. It's like I go from being an absolute nobody in the street uh, to being somebody that just gets stared at like a celebrity in a casino and the, the polarity is always a bit jarring. <laughs> Again, loads of people ask me like, what are you doing here? And I just, you know, I have to explain, it's like, you know, I'm just a human filming some shit, you know, but in this situation, I couldn't even say that because I had to be kind of on the DL. So I was giving subtle implications to the, uh, to the other people at the table that I was filming, but uh, also <laughs> trying to hide it from the dealer. So first hand that we play, we're looking down in the big line, the ace, king, offsuit. Here we go, boys. The bankroll challenge is back on. There's a lip from the hijack who is uh, a recreational player and the cutoff, a very, very chatty professional poker player, or at least looks like a professional poker player, makes it 20. We're in the big blind. We are bumping it up. If I had aces here, I'd go smaller. Just, just saying. But I've got ace king, so I'm going pretty big. What size would you go? Pause the video, let yourself know. Telepathically tell me. That's right, we go to 100 and the recreational player gets out of there and the cutoff reg makes the call. We look down at the flop of 10-6-3. It's an interesting kind of spot where our hand is actually the best hand quite often. A lot of people when they're playing poker and they three bet ace king, they miss the flop, they instantly think, well, I have to bluff, I have to rep aces or kings. It ain't the case. Instantly when I see this, I'm thinking, okay, this is a chatty guy. He's probably on the looser side. That was kind of my feel from him when I've been watching him uh, play maybe one hand. Uh, just, just that kind of energy. And I was like, okay, I want to go a size that I'm going to be put in a decision on the river. Now, bear with me. I know this is, a, this is thinking way ahead. I'm thinking if I go small flop, check call turn, check call the turn to keep in his floats and his bluffs, and then check decide river, then we are in the driver's seat where he gets to either bluff or not bluff and we get to try and make a live read because you know we have pretty good reads on people these days and we get to try and make the right decision against a, a player who probably is going to be giving off a lot of tells so the size that i go on the flop is very very small we decide to go for a 35 pound bet into a pot of what's already like 207 it's pretty crazy 35 pound very very small he makes the call the turn is a four and we're sticking with our plan we give him the check, and he makes a pretty small bet himself. So the pot's like 275, he makes a bet of 85. Now, that, that's pretty damn small, it's about a third pot. I don't know if he's repping that he's got some kind of one pair hand. I'd actually rather see a bigger bigger size, just in, you know, it, it polarizes his hand, meaning that he has fewer value hands and a lot more bluffs ratio wise. But we'll, we're sticking with the plan, we've got good live reads on the river. We check call cool and we start getting our reads. We're staring at him. The river is a four. He's looking at us. He's looking at his chips. He picks up some chips and he hits the check. We table our ace king, unsure if we're good because he can definitely be betting some kind of like one pair hands on the turn. Maybe some like pocket sevens, maybe some like eight, seven, but no problemo for us. He says ace king is good and we win the first hands and oh my god it feels good to win pots in the bankroll challenge let's keep it up boys let's go you want to know how to turn fifty dollars into ten thousand dollars i have shown you how to do it every step along the way every hand was streamed and you can watch every episode back it's a ton of hours it's over 100 hours maybe even 200 hours of footage you can watch me play you can repeat it you can regurgitate it you can crush souls and now you can get it for 43% off. I made that number off the top of my head, but it sounds like a great percentage off. I love to share this, this footage with people. I genuinely think it's the most helpful footage anybody will have for their professional poker career. With the code KC scammed me. <laughs> Just to get the word out there. All the love, guys. So we're keeping up the momentum. Very, very soon on the next orbit, we open 8-7 suited under the gun to 15 pounds. The only player to call is the big blind, and he's a recreational player. This is the absolute dream, playing these kind of hands pretty deep against recreational players. Oh my god, it's just uh, the, the thing that poker dreams are made of. I know it doesn't seem that exciting, but goddamn, when you love poker, you love these kinds of spots. So the flop is 9-8 deuce. It's an interesting spot, and instantly what we want to be doing is range analysis. If you haven't seen my video on range analysis, I'll leave a link in the description below. I really do give a detailed explanation of how these things work. 
So what are the kind of hands that the opponent can have? So he can have a bunch of misses, you know, he can have just random like king threes, things like that. He can have a bunch of maybe like overcards, king queens, king jacks. And then when it can, when he connects with the board, he can have something like 9x, 8x, deuce x, and straight draws. There's no flush draws on board. So that's like queen jacks, queen tens, jack tens, six sevens, five sevens, tons and tons and tons of straight draws, and then some pairs as well. Instantly, based on that range, we need to start analyzing. We need to start saying, hey, what are we gonna do to exploit that and be on the level above this recreational player? Now, there are a couple of ways to do this. We could chip back and then do some bluffs on the turn. However, the downside to that is on these kind of middling or low card boards, there's actually a lot of overcards that can come out. So imagine you have queen jack on like king queen three. If you check back and try and induce bluffs from a maniac, there aren't gonna be too many overcards that are possible to come out. In fact, there's only the ace. But on 9-8 deuce, you know, you can have a 10, you can have jack, queen, king, or ace. So it's actually pretty likely an overcard comes and it makes our hand a lot weaker. So I decided to go for the idea of trying to get value on the flop from straight draws and maybe some pocket sixes or something like that. Check back turn on most low turns and then call most rivers, but it really does depend. But at least in that, in that way, we're taking the driver's seat again. And this is something you'll see me doing a lot in these bankroll challenges is making sure that I'm the person having most of the decisions, not the other person. Because then if the other person's making the decision, that's where the variance comes in. But if I'm making the decision, at least I'm gonna be making good decisions, very, very good decisions against these kind of players. So let's go with it. We're C betting 10 pounds into, what is that, 32 pounds? So just about third, third pot size, he calls. Turn is a queen, it's really not the kind of card we wanna see. We're always gonna be checking back on here. There's not really too much value to turning our hands into a bluff, like we could try and fold out a nine, although he'd probably call most of his nine X on the turn, but he can also just have a queen. Uh, so it's really, really hard for him to, to have a worse hand than us and definitely very hard for us to get value. So checking is the only thing that makes any sense here. On the river, the river is a deuce and he bets 25 into a pot of 52. So it gets half pot. God damn it. <laughs> All right. Tell me what you would do, boys and girls. Tell me what you would do. Analyze this range and let me know. So usually, this is a fault. It's just so hard for him to be bluffing. Uh, we really, really can't expect him to turn up with many other hands. It's not like he would turn like pocket force into a bluff. Um, so usually, usually, usually this is a fault. However, Luckily, me being under the gun and this guy being to the right of me, we got a live read. And we got a very, very solid live read. <laughs> and I'm not gonna say what it is, because unless you're joining my poker retreat, I'm keeping these secrets and taking them to the grave. But it was a very, very solid live read. I was very, very confident about this one. We throw in the call and he tables King 10 suited with a back door flush draw on the flop. Definitely one of the hands we could have considered being in there. It's just, it's just not too many combos of it. So generally, theoretically, I'd fold this online. I'd fold this live. God bless it. We love making river decisions against recreational players or other professionals as well. It's just the absolute dream. So everything's going swimmingly. We're up a couple of hundred pounds and now we get king queen off on the button. A recreational limps the hijack and it's on us. Now, what size do we go and why? So we've got to be thinking what kind of recreational player this is. Do we want to be trying to get value? Do we want to try and get him to fold pre-flop? Generally with a hand like King Queen, it plays so well post-flop. Even when you don't hit, you just have overs and straight draws galore. It's just beautiful. I tend to want to try and go a little bit smaller with these kind of hands in these kind of spots. I want to go a size that he's going to be calling his Queen 10 offs, his Queen 9 offs, you know, his Queen 6 suited, hands like that. So it ends up going 20. Could definitely, if I had a worse hand, or even sometimes if I had Ace King, I could end up going bigger here. 20 seems like a good idea. Now the big blind, who looks like an online reg, he knows who we are, but he hasn't been super chatty, he makes it 90. And the recreational player folds, the action is on us. Pause the video, tell yourself, or tell me, what would you do? It is definitely a call. You can make some arguments for four betting here, there's definitely some arguments to be made, but I decided to go for the call. It's uh, a hand that I think we're actually gonna be ahead a decent amount. In this kind of situation, he's gonna expect us to be isolating very, very wide meaning isolating the recreational player. And I expected him to be three betting us with a lot of kind of like eight, seven suited, eight, five suited. The problem with four betting is that having my image, I've learned that if I four bet bluff, I get shoved on a lot 
with pretty light hands like ace five suited, even king jack suited hands like this. So I've learned to have a lot of value hands pre-flop in these kind of spots if I end up going for a four bet. So I go for a call. The flop's pretty good. Queen jack five, three clubs. We do not have a club in our hand, so it's it's not the best. The big blind bets 30, and this actually solidifies our read that he's an online player. This is a very GTO-esque size. That doesn't mean he's gonna be in a phenomenal GTO player, but he's at least looked at some people that have studied some charts or looked at some charts that have studied some people. I don't know how these things work, but we call. There's no decision. We don't wanna be raising. Uh, he can still have aces, he can have ace queen, he can have a bunch of hands that are better than us. He can also have a bunch of hands that are worse than my bluff. The turn is the dream. It's the queen. It's the dishwasher. Thank God to the dishwasher. I actually had this back and forth with my grindhouse. Uh, so my students kind of arranged this, this grindhouse and um, we were watching Pads' videos, you know, um, Patrick Leonard's Instagram stories. And I've been, I, I'm a big fan of Patrick Leonard's. I've, I've been watching all his stories. But he's been calling Queens Mama Sitas. And now there's, there was this big back and forth, this tribal warfare about whether to call the Queen the dishwasher or the Mama Sita. <laughs> I'm sticking with it. If you're watching the video and you want to be my friend, you know what to call it. So the turn comes out and it's given us trips. We have three queens. Now our hand has improved dramatically. If he has aces, we beat him. It's fewer combinations of ace queen. If he has kings, we now beat him. And if he has something like ace jack, he's drawing dead. Uh, so this, this, is, this is an absolute dream card. And he checks it over to us, meaning it's slightly less likely he has a flush. I think a lot of his smaller flushes would continue betting himself. Now what would you do boys? What would you do and why? There's 247 pounds in the pot. He probably has around 500 pounds back. So are we gonna go for maximum value? Are we gonna try and charge other things? It's a very, very difficult decision. So we have gotta be thinking, what, what do we wanna get called by? Do we wanna try and target his Jack X? Do we wanna target something like Ace King with the Ace of Clubs? Do we wanna target some, maybe some weaker Queen X, Queen Nine, Queen 10 suited? Do we wanna target Aces and Kings? I think all of that, the answer is yes. So I wanna go a size that I think Ace Jack still has a decent chance of calling and all of that, all of the rest of the stuff is definitely, definitely gonna call. So I go for a half pot bet, also keeping our range pretty wide in a GTO player's mind. He thinks that we, if, you know, if, if he saw us just go huge here, I think he would think that we'd, we would be under bluffing uh, because it's pretty, it, it doesn't make too much sense from his perspective for us to go big with the bluff. Replay me saying that a few times if you didn't quite catch that. I'm not gonna go too far into the analysis in this exact hands. He makes the call and the river is, it's the fucking ten of clubs. It's a fucking ten of clubs. So we now lose to any club. We now lose to Ace King. If he happened to just check all Ace King, no club on the turn. Uh, if he had pocket tens, we lose to that. But the the main thing is now we lose to Aces with a club. Ace King with a club. <sighs> he checks to us. Do we consider bluffing? Now that is a question. You know, could we? Could, obviously, if you even thought that, get out of here. He just has the Ace of clubs loads. We check back expecting to lose a huge percentage of the time, hopefully win versus something like red aces, queen ten of hearts, and lo and behold, he flips over the queen nine of spades. Let's go boys, the queen nine of fucking spades. Man, there are actually are so few combos that we beat on the river compared to combos that beat us. Uh, so many hands with the club will check all the turn, like ace jack with the ace of clubs for, is another example of that. So just so many hands that could have beaten us, we're running great, feeling great, and now we run into some difficulty. The dealer has been seeing that we've been pointing our phone quite consistently at the board and quite consistently at our cards. Now, they've put two and two together, unfortunately, and decided that we've been filming and they've given us a verbal warning. Our cover has been blown. They know that we're recording now and we're gonna play the rest of the session without recording. I gotta admit, I was a little tilted at this. I've just had so many issues running into trying to record this bankroll challenge, you know, obviously getting scammed, which you'll hear about soon. And uh, the only other option being to play in institutions and the institutions not giving me filming permission and then being so strict on it. I, I gotta be honest, I was pretty tilted. And things start to go pretty downhill after this. So obviously I don't have the footage to show you as I'm a good boy and I do what I told. In fact, I did try recording once more and then <laughs> I told off again. I was like, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm being stupid. So one hand that happens, we had king eight suited on the hijack. We open, 
But in three bets, the, the reg that we had the king queen against, and I decided to go for a four bet with this exact combination just for fun, just because I felt like he was going to be over three betting me because it was a recreational in the big blinds. He shoves and we fold. And I'm not going to bore you with too many of the details, but we had around 10 hands like this. 10 hands where we either bluff or we just have the second best hand. We have to fold not a single showdown that I can remember. Uh, another hand that we had, it goes open from a chatty reg that we had the ace king against early on. A recreational player calls the cutoff. We have nines on the button. Don't know whether to squeeze, don't know whether to call. I was a little bit tilted and I'm always leaning towards <laughs> the more aggressive action when I'm tilted. And uh, I ended up squeezing the small blind four bets. So we made it 60. The small blind four bets us to 180. And we're about a thousand pounds deep. We make the call. He C bets tiny, like 15 to 20% on ace, eight, five, two diamonds. We have the nine of diamonds. I justify making another call. Turns uh, seven, giving us a gut shot. He bets again and we just fold. And it's just like these kind of situations where if I were playing normally, I would have just flat pre. I probably might have folded to the four bet. Um, I would have definitely folded to the flop and I was just making very, very slight EV, minus EV decisions. My energy was bad and uh, I realized that I was just playing pretty badly. Luckily, I was blessed with one more bink. That's right, boys. Hannah Lessington's turned up to the party. And even though I'm down quite a few hundred pounds now after, you know, not, not so many bad hands, but just a few kind of annoying spots that came up after my energy dropped, it is such a blessing to see such a beautiful lover in my midst. And may I say that she might be the only person that was getting more stares than me <laughs> in the casino. So it's always beautiful to be able to share your burdens <laughs> with other people. Uh, the burden of losing and the burden of being looked at by <laughs> people that you've never met. So Hannah and I leave the casino. We cash out for a whopping minus 412 pounds. Now we started with $10,000 and it looks like we might have maybe one more shot at two five before we have to drop down to one two. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna show the dream is still so much fucking alive. We're gonna make this 10K into 100K and then I am going to take that 100K and turn it into a million playing live tournaments. I'm calling it now. If the tournaments let me film, which I feel like they will in the future, I feel like things are gonna open up for, for streamers and for vloggers as casinos and other places realize that it's just in their best interest to make exceptions for these people. So that is the dream, that is the plan. Now let me tell you about how I got scammed. As you saw from the first video, that you can see here. I did really well. I went to a private club, which I didn't name because I wanted to keep it kind of on the DL because that's what they asked me to do. And I won 1,700 pounds. Let's fucking go. For a 10K bankroll, that's great. That's, that's fucking like 2.1K dollar. Something went awry. And let me tell you the tale of how a few people, including yours truly, had a little punt. So this place, which was previously unnamed, but now I shall name, called the Kingsman Club in London, has failed to pay me out my 1,700 pounds. Now, I'm as shocked as you. I'm as shocked as you, because they're a reputable-ish club. They're pretty reputable. They play all the time. They make a ton of money through rake and through different things, you know, having players in the game. It's, it's a good business model that they have, and it was generally run by really cool, friendly people. From what I from what I had seen, it wasn't the first time I played there. And secondly, if you put yourself in the mind of the people running Kingsman Club, if they're like, okay, 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 we're gonna scam a few professional poker players. Who should we get? Who should we get? Should we get Hoodie Mook Earphoneson? Who? That has like three followers on Twitter and hasn't gone outside his house apart from to play live poker in the last 16 years. No, 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 no. He, 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 he'll probably maybe write us an angry letter in 13 years after he gets it out and finally tells somebody. No, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't scam him. Should we scam Chatty McReg Chatterson that we don't really want in our game because he annoys all the fish? No, 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 no. We should scam the guy that's got a platform that's big enough to out us and a grudge that lasts eras. <laughs> so he's motivated to out us and make sure that their game doesn't run anymore. Kingsman Club, I'm not gonna name who it is unless 
they rebrand, which one of them said that they might, and then call it something else. In which case, I'll be forced to say who it was that I was dealing with, so people can be wary of all the different names of different clubs that can come up. Kingsman Club. When I first was cashing out, I was going for £1,700 plus my £1,000 buy-in. They were like, okay, okay. We'll give you your 1K back, but because not everyone else has finished cashing out, because you know you're not the you're the first player out because I left early because I've got a normal bedtime. These guys play until fucking like 8 a.m. or whatever, until maybe 8 p.m. the next day. Uh, I just thought, okay, that, that seems normal. I didn't think there was any chance. I thought there was probably like under 1% chance that I wouldn't ever get, I wouldn't get paid. Probably like 0.1% or something like that from my perspective, even though I guess now looking back, that's probably a bit too generous. But I just thought it'd be a, such a pun not to pay me out. So I was like, yeah, that seems super fine. A week goes past, I'm like, hey, brother. Hey, brother. Let's call him, uh, let's call him Barry. Hey Barry, I've, uh, I've still not been paid. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll get it to you, I'll get it to you. What's your bank details? It's like, oh, okay, I'll give you my bank details. Another week goes past. I'm like, hey, hey brother, nothing hit my bank yet. Yeah, forget it. And he's like, oh, it's, it's, it's okay, it's okay. We'll, we'll drop the cash off to you. Where do you want it dropped to? I was like, I don't want to give out my home address, but maybe I can get a friend to pick it up. They're like, we're not replying for a week. I was like, oh, okay, it's fine, it's fine. I've dealt with poker players before, 1,700 pounds, no big, no big. Three weeks go by and I'm like, hey brother, uh, you, you've kind of been ghosting me. And there's something about people that when you call them out for ghosting you, they have to reply. There's something, I don't know if you guys have ever lent your mate 50 quid and then he's not paid you back and you mess him like 16 times being like, hey, hey, what's up? You've got that 50? But as soon as you say, you're ghosting me, that like direct confrontation, they're like, how dare you say, how dare you say I'm ghosting you? So this, this is where it starts getting a little bit heated, where I get, I, I start getting a little weird vibes from, from Barry, let's call him. He's like, okay, bro, bro, it's nothing, it's zero, it's basically no money, you're obviously gonna get paid, stop worrying about it. So I'll just give it over to my friend who will also pay you, let's call him Kevin. So Kevin's like, hey brother, what's your bank details? I was like, finally, Kevin, you're my savior. You can pay, him out, pay me out now. And Kevin's like, I got you, bro. Three days ago past, I'm like, Kev, uh, these things, I mean, I know it's not, crypto or anything but it's still pretty quick right like it's, it shouldn't take three days for something to go through he's like bro 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 i feel you i feel you we'll get get it to you in cash and i feel like you guys are getting the pattern of what's going on more and more and more i'm getting befuddled because i'm still in the mindset that it would be such a bad gambit i don't know if you guys play chess but some some gambits they're just bad you know you call it you call it a gambit but it's not really a gambit it's just a it's really bad play like you punch it off and you're minus three out of the opening it felt like a really bad gambit on their behalf so i was still like okay they're probably just being disorganized eventually kevin hands me over to uh zenith he's, he's like the new boss and zenith is like bro 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 you've been dealing with barry barry ain't working for us no more Nani? I'm not like him. And I'm like, okay, okay, brother, can I, can I get my money? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll get it, I'll get it. Give me a second. And so a few days go past, I'm like, Zenith, bro. And he's like, bro, why are you being, why are you being so pushy on this, man? This was Barry's fault, this ain't me. I was like, Zenith, with all due respect, my friend, you probably should be taking responsibility for your employees past or present. And uh, depending on their actions and depending if they've got any debts to pay, that's part of your problem if this is your business. And he's like, Bro, this is pennies, mate. You don't even know. This is like just pennies to me. This is, maybe I get some screenshots of the conversation. Bro, this is just pennies to me. So I'm like, okay, all right. Just so you know, just so you know, I'm gonna have to like post online if I don't get it in the next couple of days. Because guys, and this is something that took me a long time to learn in life. Perhaps I can share a little bit of old man wisdom here. 28 now, by the way, getting fucking up there, huh? Sometimes in life, you gotta set boundaries, whether it's in a work relationship or in a personal relationship, you gotta set boundaries. And then if somebody goes over that boundary, you have to do something. You have to say, okay, if you do this, if you do X, I will do Y. And then if they do X, you have to do Y, even though sometimes it sucks to do Y. A couple of days go past and he's like, bro, bro, bro. Zenith's like, bro, 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 I'm getting somebody to come to your house and drop it off. I was like, perfect, I've got a friend that lives nearby. You can drop it off to him. Doesn't happen, he ignores me that night. I'm like, okay, Zenith, with all the love and all the respect, well, not so much of the respect anymore, I'm gonna have to post online. So I post it online. He'd already been kind of mocking the idea. It's like, bro, if you wanna like post it online, just fucking be my guest and it's not like it's gonna bother me or anything. We'll, ju we'll just rebrand. We'll just call ourselves something else. The logic's not quite there, because you know, I can just, post some more details and the word will get around, spreads like wildfire, these things. And as soon as I post online, I actually get more people responding saying, hey, this guy owes me, it was like 13K or something like that. Hey, they're really known for this. I'm like, 
Thanks for telling me, literally anybody. Turns out this is a thing that they do. Uh, I guess non-selectively, if they did it to me, they're just doing it fucking off a whim. And uh, now I'm, I'm starting to think, okay, there's very unlikely I'm actually gonna see this money. And Zenith starts getting pretty aggressive. And at one point, I had to tell him straight. Let's see if I get the quote up here. Because <laughs> he said, eh. <laughs> Let's see if the quotes work. And uh, he didn't like that. Surprisingly, he didn't like that. My ego's getting a bit tickled as well at this point. It's not a bad thing to have a big ego as long as you get it under control and as long as you can act with love behind the ego and kind of integrate it into your being. In fact, it's a good thing. I think some spiritual people, they try and just dismantle the ego and then they, they're just left a bit lackless, you know? There's just not too much oof behind them. And that's why a lot of spiritual people struggle with money, I think, it's one of the reasons. We're, our ego's getting a little bit flared. We're having a bit, bit of a back and forth with Zenith, getting the feeling we're not gonna get our money and Finally, he outright says, you are not getting paid a penny. And that was it for me. And he wanted to keep tussling back and forth, but as soon as I saw that, I had the evidence I needed and I blocked him. Zenith and I are no more. Our friendship was brief, it was fiery, it was passionate. We learned a lot from each other, we triggered each other. And now Zenith and I are gonna have to put this behind us and say that it was a toxic relationship from the beginning. We were kidding ourselves for thinking that we could be good for one another. You're an asshole, Zenith. Give me my 1,700 pounds back. I, it's not that I care about, I do care about the money because 1,700 pounds, you can fucking feed a whole family for fucking years and fucking Yemen. You know, money, it really does go a long way in other places. And because I'm a sensitive softy, I really care about that shit, man. It's not, it's not so much that though. It's not so much that. It's more the bankroll challenge priorities.